Hello, my name is Alan Foom, and today I'm going to talk about a basic introduction to different types of oil exploration contracts. So what is an oil exploration contract? It's the right for a petroleum company to produce oil and gas from a given tract of land, a given territory, either land or at sea. Also known as a license or a lease, depends on the country. And I'll look at different types of uh, these licenses. One thing to bear in mind, word of caution, that this is just a basic introduction aimed at non commercial specialists, technical people. So please do consult a commercial and gas professional or landman for more details for any specific country or state, because the terms do vary, and this is a very basic introduction to give people an overview of what these things are. So this is a table, uh, which I'm going to go through in some detail, about the different types of resource contracts. So here we have uh, types of resource ownership. So we have full res private resource ownership. So this is what you have in America, where a person or owns the land, who owns the land, has the mineral rights, and they can do what they like with it. Then you have a concession or a license with tax and royalty uh, terms, for example, Britain and Norway. And this is when an oil company produces hydrocarbons on behalf of the government and tax is taxed for it and pays a royalty to the government for, for the right to do so. Then you have a production sharing contract where the oil company acts as a contractor in a spade and a share of a production. Then you have a service contract where an oil company acts as a contractor for the government that owns the oil and they're paid for, the, for producing it for them on their behalf. So let's first of all look at full private ownership. So this is what happens in the USA. I think it might happen in parts of Canada. This is when hydrocarbon resources are fully owned by the mineral rights owner. It's usually the landowner, but it's not always together. Sometimes mineral rights are sold separately. And then the rights owner, the mineral rights owner, can lease the land to an oil company for production via commercial negotiation, but there's also government land, either state land or federal land, which the state or the federal authorities in America would uh, sell through lease sales. And they will happen periodically, normally once a year. The reserves that are on there are on the company balance sheet. So if you have a lease, you own it, you can do what you like with it, it belongs to you. It's on your company balance sheet as an asset. The whole company then pays profit taxes, may have to spe uh, pay special petroleum taxes in some jurisdiction, as well as lease fees to the to the uh, rights owner if they lease it. Um, it obviously depends on the state, depends on the territory, depends on how things are done. Sometimes people might just buy a, a lease outright. Uh, there's broad regulation, it's generally limited, for example, for safety. So you get regulators that, such as the Alaska Natural Resources Commission, Minerals Management Service, Texas Railroad Commission, etc. And there's a petroleum regulator in virtually every state in America. Uh, National Oil Company, what's one of them? Uh, they don't exist in America. And uh, the rights are held in perpetuity by the rights owner. The lease itself may have a time period. Obviously, it depends on how things are done. And the leases can be freely bought and sold. So full commercial, full private ownership. People can do pretty much what they like within, obviously, legal bounds. Moving to the next stage, which is the tax and royalty system or the concession system. So this is, for example, in Britain and Norway. So the hydrocarbon resources are now owned by the government. Um, used to be the crown in the UK. It's not that the Queen personally owns it, it's the government that owns it. Um, and they license all companies to produce the hydrocarbons on the nation's behalf. And they have periodic licensing rounds. Companies are awarded license and um, they then produce the hydrocarbons, pay tax to the government, pay a royalty to the government in some cases. Sometimes there's also special petroleum tax. Um, the reserves are on the company balance sheet. Uh, because they belong to the company, uh, to the company uh, in terms of uh, reserves, or the right to produce those reserves belongs to the company. Uh, got more detailed regulations by uh, state regulators, such as the OGA in the UK or the MPD in Norway. Uh, they have fixed contract terms for companies. So there's a, basically a contract term that applies to everybody. So everybody pays the same tax rate. Everybody pays the same royalty rate within uh, a particular time period. Um, there's normally no participation by a national oil company, but Norway does have the state direct financial interest. Uh, and obviously, happy for Norwegians to comment on that. The licenses will have a time period. So an expiration license would have a typical time period of three years, four years, five years, or whatever it would be by the licensing route. Uh, but the field would belong to the uh, owners for the life of its production. And interest can be sold and bought, but they do require government approval to do so. But normally, it's that's fairly often a given, providing it's sold between one competent operator to another. Moving towards production sharing contracts, 
uh, this tends to get a little bit more complicated. So countries like India, Malaysia, Egypt, Nigeria, and many others. So the hydrocarbon resources are owned by the government, and they contract the oil company, that's referred to as a contractor, to produce these resources on the nation's behalf. The contractor is then paid in a share of the oil and gas production. And there are two parts of that. There's cost oil, which is used to recover costs that are incurred in developing the field, and then there's profit oil, which is uh, on top of that. The company also has to pay various petroleum taxes, profit taxes, etc. And it's quite, uh, you know, quite complicated, and uh, I really would advise you to talk to a commercial person about each specific P uh, PSC. Uh, only the entitlement portion of the reserves is uh, on the company balance sheet. So uh, that's the effectively um, not everything. More, far more detailed regulations than you would see in a tax and royalty system. So you would deal with the regulators such as NAPIMS in Nigeria, DGH in India, NP in Brazil, etc. And if there's a national oil company, they will almost inevitably precipitate, uh, participate in the joint venture. They may have to be carried through some of the exploration phase with back-end rights where they can buy back into the, uh, into, the, uh, uh, into the field if it's a success. So no risk to the national oil company. The, the foreign company takes all the exploration risk. The PSCs usually have a fixed time period, which is something that can catch out people who are not used to them. For example, typically it would be 20 to 25 years. At the end of that time, the field and everything that's in it so all the wells, all the facilities will be given back to the National Oil Company. Now, it could be that uh, a PSC is extended by negotiation, or it could be that it's pulled out to a completely new tender. So another company can come in, bid for the, t bid for the uh, PSC rights in a new tender organised by the government, and they can, uh, they can then take it on. Uh, PSCs can also be bought and sold, so interest in PSCs can be bought and sold but very much with government consent. And the government takes a far stronger line with their PSCs than it does with, let's say, tax and royalty systems, in my personal experience. A service contract is the final type of uh, resource, well, non-ownership, really, because you don't own it. Hydrocarbon resources are owned by the government, and they contract the oil company to produce them on the nation's behalf. The oil company is, is either paid in cash, for example, $10 a barrel, and out of that $10 a barrel, you finance everything. That's a pure service contract. Or you can have a profit share, which is risk service, where, let's say for sake of argument, you would be paid certain amounts, and be certain amounts relative to uh, how much uh, oil is sold for. So you might get some upside in, a, in an oil uh, price spike, or some also share the downs or have mitigation on downside if there's an oil price crash. And all company product, um, obtains this contract from the government, either during a licensing round or by a uh, out of round deal, so a specific deal for a specific field. These these oil reserves, however, are not on the company's balance sheet, unlike the PSCs. All company will pay profit taxes and various ta other taxes, varies by contract, varies by country. Very detailed regulations from the state regulator because you're effectively a contractor doing work for them. The national oil company almost always participates, and the service contract would usually be for a fixed time period, at the end of which uh, the contract may be extended maybe put out to a new tender, etc., etc. So a very much disadvantageous type of contract relative to the others, but an oil company might buy into it to get a steady revenue. This is a map from Reichstadt Energy, a major oil and gas consultancy, which shows the different types of uh, contract around the world. So you can see, for example, the greens are the uh, concessions for royalty and tax, and the oranges are production sharing contracts, which are uh, in Libya, uh, India, etc. Some um, uh, governments have got hybrid regimes, so they used to, for instance, have PSCs and then they moved to tax royalty or vice versa. Some of the old contracts still exist. Others, uh, such as Iran, have a pure service contract. Mexico used to have a pure service contract, but that didn't attract many people, so they moved to having a uh, a tax royalty system for some of the new licenses, uh, which would attract more foreign investment. Uh, so different types of contract in different countries, and it does change through time. So just to sum up, there's a little uh, diagram. So hydrocarbons at the wellhead where they're produced, if, they go, if you own them, then it's a tax royalty system. If the government owns them, it's a contractual system. If the payments in kind through hydrocarbons, it's a production sharing contract or production sharing agreement. 
Uh, so you can either have net production after costs or gross production, depending on the PSC type. If you've paid in cash, it's a service contract. You can either have a profit share, we have a risk contract, or a flat service fee. So this explains different types of oil contracts that you will encounter and gives you a brief introduction to how these things are. But if you want to know more, really would suggest you consult an expert, either somebody within your com company or somebody from an outside consultancy such as Reichstadt, Wood Mackenzie, IHS, and people like that who can give you a far better idea than, uh, than, uh, than a geologist like me. Thank you very much.